on a gray afternoon in December. On the outskirts of Summit, Mississippi, a cabin sits on a fringe of woods. Inside the cabin, a young couple, Daryl and Annie Perry, and their four-year-old daughter, Crystal. All three are dead and have been for some time. Pike County Sheriff C.V. Glennis and investigator Alan Applewhite from the Mississippi Highway Patrol worked the scene. In the front room, there were two victims lying on the floor. Uh, in an adjoining bedroom, there was a small child victim in the middle of the bed. It was maggots. The floor was when you walked. I mean, you know, they were crunching underneath your feet. With a video camera rolling, the two men worked their way through what was once a house and is now a nightmare. The investigator's first question, are they looking at an accident or murder? There was no sign of struggle in the building. The victims were laid on the floor. Nothing was out of place. Detectives begin their investigation with the man who found the bodies, Darrell Perry's stepfather, Michael Rubenstein. I told him. I needed to talk with him. Yeah, he was the one that discovered it, so he came sat down and talked with me for a while. Rubenstein tells police he owns the cabin, drove the Perrys there on November 4th or 5th, and returned to the cabin on November 27th or 28th. No one answered the door when he got there, and Rubenstein himself had forgotten his key. So according to him, he leaves, goes back home to Louisiana, and then a week or so later, gets his keys and comes up and opens the door and that's what he finds. Investigators track down Daryl Perry's brother, David, figuring he might know a bit more about who might want his brother dead. David agrees to meet detectives at the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. Perry tells detectives if they look hard enough, they will find an insurance policy somewhere in the Perry killings with connections to Rubenstein. Detectives pull insurance records and discover David Perry is right. A little more than two years prior to Crystal's death, Rubenstein took out a $250,000 life insurance policy on his step-granddaughter, ample motive for murder. David Perry then lays waste to Michael Rubenstein's alibi. The stepfather told police he visited the cabin on November 27th or 28th, well after the coroner's time of death, estimated at around November 16th. Perry says that's a lie that Rubenstein visited the cabin on the 16th, and that David himself spoke with Rubenstein the next day. Rubenstein, at that point, asked if he was a suspect, and when I asked him, can you give me your activities on the 16th and 17th of November, he invoked his right to attorney, and the interview ended at that time. Rubenstein lawyers up and goes silent. With a lot of suspicions, but no physical evidence tying Rubenstein to the crime, prosecutors decline to take the case before a grand jury. The case goes cold, but is not forgotten. It's just something that can't be forgotten. The little girl needed justice. Five years after the Perry murders, Investigator Alan Applewhite watches a young prosecutor at work on a different case. The deputy DA's name is Bill Goodwin. The case, one of murder for money. A father who killed his own child and cashed in the life insurance policy. When the jury returned a verdict of guilty, I got to Bill and said, Bill, I've got a better case where three died than you just convicted this one on. He brought me the file on a Friday afternoon, uh, and I spent the entire weekend at my dining room table at home reading it. Monday morning, I met with the elected district attorney and told the district attorney, this is something we really need to look into. Not far from the football stadium on the campus of the University of Tennessee, is a place known as the Body Farm. Here, Dr. William Bass studies the process of human decay and decomposition. In 1980, I started a facility in which I would put bodies out under various conditions, clothing, no clothing, sunshade, and record what happened and how long it 
took for various changes of the body to occur. 40 years of experience with corpses has made Bass the world's leading expert on determining how long someone has been dead. He agrees to help Bill Goodwin with his case on one condition. Dr. Bass, at the beginning of the conversation, told me, I do not want you to tell me when you think these people died. When people like that call, what I try to do is to tell them, I will tell you as accurately as I can how long those individuals have been dead. Bass reviews pictures of the crime scene and autopsy photos and initially feels confident that Perry's had been dead at least one month. Such a finding would ruin the defense's timeline and make Michael Rubenstein a prime suspect for the murder. And looking at the photographs, and the amount of decay suggested to me that these individuals had been dead somewhere between 28 and about 34 days. Bass then turns to a study of bugs infesting the body, and that's where he begins to run into problems. One of your major factors in decay, of course, is are the first critters to be attracted to decaying bodies are the blowflies. Within hours of death, blowflies swarm over a dead body and lay eggs, which hatch and become maggots. For up to 14 days, those maggots mature and grow and eventually seal themselves up in what are called pupa cases. Three to five days later, the pupa case peels open and the maggot reemerges as a fly. As Bass studies pictures of the Perry family, he looks for pupa cases left after the metamorphosis, a sure sign that the two and a half week process has run its course. Bass, however, doesn't find any such cases. There were no pupa cases. Nobody had ever seen the pupa cases before. And the photographs are such that you don't see them in the photographs either. Based on the amount of decomposition, Bass still believes the time of death to be mid-November, but cannot fully explain the lack of pupa cases. It is a hole in the state's theory of murder that may prove fatal to their case. In the winter of 2000, Bill Goodwin takes a second crack at convicting Michael Rubenstein of murder. Dr. Bass takes the stand and testifies that the Perrys were most likely dead at least a month before their bodies were discovered. The defense cross-examines Bass, once again making a point of the lack of pupa cases found on any of the bodies. After his testimony, Dr. Bass sits in the back of the courtroom and watches as the state medical examiner gives testimony. On an overhead screen flash photos from the autopsies. Suddenly, Dr. Bass sees a picture he had never seen before. It's a close-up of the head of four-year-old Crystal Perry. When she got up to show her slides, this was something that Bill Goodwin didn't know about or didn't, nobody knew about, really. She's showing the slides of the bodies in, in the morgue and in the little girl's hair. Uh, you could see pupa cases. In the midst of the state medical examiner's testimony, Dr. Bass rises from his seat and asks to examine the photos. Then Goodwin puts Bass back on the stand. We pointed out on the defense's picture that, hey, this is what we've been looking for. The new photos put to rest any doubts about time of death and clinch the case against Michael Rubenstein. Seven years after the fact, he is convicted of killing his own family so he could profit from an insurance policy taken out on his four-year-old step-granddaughter. This was as evil an act as I think you can ever see, to kill a little girl for insurance proceeds, for money. You just don't get any more evil than that. I have never seen a man that his expression, he, the epitome of evil. On February 5th, 2000, Michael Rubenstein is sentenced to die by lethal injection. 